Hello, welcome to today's edition of the program lined up in preparation for your upcoming conference. My name is Isaac Okoku J. During the conference, I will be the president of the Security Council, but today I'm your facilitator. We're going to be talking about the General Assembly of the United Nations and how the committee would be simulated when you arrive in Ghana for the conference. So I'll start with the General Assembly or the United Nations, I would say. So the United Nations was founded in October 1945 after the Second World War. Little history makes us understand that after the First World War, the League of Nations was established to maintain international peace and security. But with the advent of the breakup of the Second World War, the League of Nations was dissolved and the United Nations, then the United Nations Organization was formed in 1945. And we would say, barring its difficulties, it's been a success. At least we all enjoy the international region, we all enjoy the peace and security that it's worked hard towards. So, the United Nations, in order to perform its functions, have some main organs, well, six main organs. And these organs are the United Nations General Assembly, which we'll be discussing shortly. We have the United Nations Security Council. There is the United Nations Economic and Social Council, that is with economic, social, and environmental issues. We have the United Nations Trusteeship Council, which was formed uh, you know, after the Second World War, after the demise of the Axis Group. The countries that they, they took control of were handed over to the Trusteeship Council to help lead them into independence. The Trusteeship Council is not as active as it used to be before 1994. We have the United Nations Secretariat that acts as the administrative organ of the United Nations, handled by the Secretary, handled by the Secretary General, and we have the International Court of Justice, which provides legal advice to the United Nations. So the United Nations General Assembly, which is the deliberative organ of the United Nations, I just refer to it as a representative organ of the United Nations. It houses all the 193 member states of the United Nations with the Holy See and Palestine having observer status. Uh, at this point, I might say that the United Nations is an organization that is very procedural in its, uh, in its activities. By procedural, I mean that everything done at the United Nations level is well structured. Everything done at the United Nations level has a set of ethics, have a set of procedures, have a set of structures that it follows to come up with whatever decision that it, it, it arrives at. So, um, honorable delegates, I think most of you are excited about coming to Ghana, but in order to enjoy this conference, it's very important that you understand the procedures that are going to be used during the committee simulations. It's, it's many, I believe most of you have read the background guides that have been given to you and have some questions in mind. So I would go into the background guide and I'll try and explain a few things in the background guide that would help you to better appreciate and better enjoy the conference when you come to Ghana in July. So um, at this time, I believe most of you are also aware of the committees you would be, you would be working from and you have been introduced to your presidents or the various groups and the chairs, you can contact them and they would help you to also understand the procedural nature of the upcoming conference. So when you are seated in your committee rooms, I would expect that you all come in with a lot of confidence and open mind and the will to come and learn and impact. In the committee rooms, you will be ordered by your chair or the president of the committee to sit down I think your, the, the arrangement will be done for you so that you know exactly where you are going to be sitting with your placard of your country of delegation written boldly and nicely on it so you know exactly where to sit. So the, one, the first order of business is the roll call. That's the first order of business when everybody is seated in the committee. The committee chair would welcome and introduce the days. The days represent the officials in the committee being the chair, the vice chair, rapporteur, secretary, those people comprised of the days. So the days would, would welcome you and the introduction of the officials would be done. 
the first order of business is the roll call. So the committee chair with, with the, the rapporteur would mention every country present in the committee. And when that is done, there are two appropriate responses or two possible responses. You will either respond present or present and voting. And these responses are extremely important so far as the general deliberations in the committee is concerned from the start to the finish. Here, I would advise as all those who become as observers would respond present because they will not be taking part in the substantive votes, only the procedural. When I say substantive votes, the substantive votes only covers the vote that has to do with the working papers, that has to do with the draft resolution and the final resolution, or when it comes to the voting procedure, which I'll go into. Delegates are mostly advised to respond present and voting. At this point, let me state that when you respond present and voting, it means that you do you cannot abstain during the voting on substantive issues so when you get to the point where the resolutions have been drawn once you responded present and voting at that early stage you cannot abstain from the votes so that's something you should keep in mind so once the responses has been given the the, 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 the chair will take the number and ensure that the modern united nations procedures some Modern United Nations prefer one third population, one third membership to be present for there for a quorum to be formed. Others also look at one fourth. But for our conference, we'll be looking at one third. So once that one third population has one third membership has been agreed on, we accept we we inform the house that a quorum has been formed and procedures would would continue. He advised delegates that. When the roll call is done and a delegate happens not to be in the committee room, upon your arrival, the first thing to do is to write your delegation on a piece of paper which will be provided and your voting status, whether you be present or you be present and voting, and give it to the reporter who eventually would inform the chair about it. If you do not do this, the chair or the president of the committee cannot recognize you in the course of the debate or the co committee simulation because you've not been properly acknowledged. After that's been done, the next step is setting the agenda. As most of you are already aware, for the conference coming up, we have two topics that we are going to be discussing. So these topics are the agenda. And in setting the agenda, motions would be, would be accepted by the chair. In modern United Nations activities, in order to catch the attention of the chair, you left your placard. Um, I remember there are times that some delegates unknowingly would raise their hand and try to stand up to catch the attention of the chair. That is not done in modern United Nations. You left your placard and until you are acknowledged by the chair, you do not stand. So you lift your placard when the chair acknowledges you, you go ahead and you move your motion to set the agenda. I must say that there are various motions or points that one can stand on or raise during this session. I'll try as, I'll try as much as possible to go into all these motions, these various motions. So, setting the agenda is basically agreeing on the topic to be discussed first. And in so doing, if a, a, a committee member or a delegate is ready to set a, uh, an agenda, as I've already said, you have to lift your placard. When you get quite catch the attention of the chairperson, you would be acknowledged. And you can make a simple statement as, I, the delegate of Russia, do move that committee topic one should be accepted as the agenda for the day. It's as simple as that. And you know, I believe maybe other committee members would also raise their placard to search different uh, different uh, agendas for the day, but that should not be your worry. Your worry is to ensure that you move the right motion and you say the right words. When you stand, you, you mention the motion upon which you are standing. 
So you are standing on the motion to set the agenda and you state the topic you want to discuss. At this point, a delegate can stand on the motion which we refer to as the motion to suspend the debate. What this basically means is that the delegate is requesting that the formal session is suspended for the committee to move into an informal session to discuss whatever thing that wants to be discussed. In some of the United Nations conferences, some delegates would rise and seek the attention of the chair to move into, to suspend the debate and state what they want to go and do. And for, for our conference, we just accept that when you stand and make your motion to suspend the debate, you are good. The most important thing is that you have to state how long you want the suspension to be. So delegates from China moves a motion that the debate is suspended for five minutes. This motion is not subject for debate. Once this motion is moved, the chair acknowledges the motion, repeats the motion, and is voted on. With a simple majority, the motion stands. So in this instance, when, there, when it's realized that sometimes there are various motions passed in terms of the topic that wants to be discussed, a motion for suspension of debates can be made and delegates would among themselves go and have discussions and come back and determine what topic they want to what topic they want to, 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 to look at as the agenda for the day. One thing is that once a motion has been moved, dear delegates, you can withdraw the motion. And in order to withdraw a motion, you write it on a paper or in a note that will be provided and you get it to the attention of the chairperson of your committee and you would be you would be called upon and the motion would be withdrawn. So most importantly, once the topic the topic don't forget we are still at the point of agenda setting. So when one delegate moves that agenda one is chosen and another delegate moves that agenda two is rather first discussed, the chairperson would inform the house about the two motions that is before the house and they would be voted on. Dear delegates, once the, once the, the motion has been passed and the, uh, a voting will be done on them, all that is required is a simple majority. So when the two, the two um, assuming there are two motions before the house, the chairperson mentions that, okay, we have before us a motion from the delegate of Cuba moving that committee agenda one is discussed, committee topic one is discussed as the first agenda. And another motion indicating from France indicated that committee topic two should be discussed as the first agenda. First come, first serve. So when the first motion is placed before the house to be voted on, those in favor of the motion will make it known, those against the motion would make, the, uh, make it also known by lifting of placards. And that will be, that will be done for committee agenda the topic two as well. When that is done, then the, the committee, the, the, the motion with the highest number of votes end up being the motion that would be discussed. Fellow delegates, right, once we are done with this, the next step is the opening of the speaker's list. The speaker's list is a very, very important list because it is based on the speaker's list that delegates would be called upon to state on their country's position in respect of the agenda. So at this point, the chairperson would inform the House that the delegates list has been opened. For our conference, the delegates list is a continuous list. It doesn't end. So once the chairperson informs the House that the delegates list, had the speaker's list has been opened, delegates who desire to be on the speaker's list do so by showing their placards. So you lift your placards, you are acknowledged and you drop your placard. So once this has been done, since it's an open list, I would, I would say, when the, 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 the chairperson has opened the speaker's list and you did not lift your placard at the early stages, at any point in time when you desire to be on the speaker's list, you would have to inform the chair by writing to the days. 
once you do that it will be acknowledged and your name will be added to the speakers list so once the speakers list has been decided on mostly the next step is to decide on the speaker's time so a motion will be entertained but for our conference per our rules of proceeding 90 seconds has already been allotted as a speaker's time so 90 seconds every delegate is entitled to 90 seconds use that 90 seconds to express his or her country's position and this is very interesting now that i expect you to take note mostly during modern united nations conference um, many delegates prefer using the word i as their personal pronoun i in modern united nations circles i is not accepted you are there as the delegate of your state so whatever statement you make you are making it as a representation of your state so i would advise that whatever statements you make you structure your sentence to actually indicate that you are making the statement not in your capacity but as a representative of your state we are not you will not be called by your name your fellow delegates will be referred to as fellow delegates from their country of representation as well so once the speakers list has been opened members have joined the speakers list and the speakers time has been established then per the structure of the speakers time uh, speakers list delegates will be called upon to give their positions honorable delegates i would keep, at this at this point make you understand that all the point of uh, the uh, the motions or the points that you've seen in there the the rules of procedures are applicable I've already mentioned the motion for the suspension of debate. This motion can be entertained at any point in time during the debate, but I advise that you not make it very distracting. One other motion that is quite popular in modern United Nations circle is the point of order. And point of order primarily is, is used to correct a procedural error. No, as I mentioned in the early part of the submission that modern United Nations is quite procedural. So when the right procedure is not used, a delegate can rise on the point of order to correct the deficiency or to correct the abnormality in the, in the, in the procedure. So when you rise on the point of order, you, you make it known to the house that this is the point you've, this is the point of which you are rising, you state where you think there has been a mistake so far as the procedure is concerned and you make it known what should be the right thing. Honorable delegates, your words or the statements you make is not the final word because the chairperson would have to also confirm from the rules of procedure if you are right. If you are right, the, the, um, the, the, the procedure will be corrected and done. If you are wrong, you'll be respectfully told and the committee session would continue as the various delegates are giving or are making their positions known there are sometimes that they are factual representations and sometimes emotions get high that some delegates impugn on the sovereignty or the integrity of other sovereign states modern united nations provide a remedial remedy for this so when you are a delegate of a country and you realize that some factual errors are being given in respect of the position of your country or the integrity or sovereignty of your country is being imputed upon, you have the opportunity to rise on the point of reply. Point of reply, you rise on the point of reply to correct the factual error or to state the, the actual country's position in order to clear any misconception in the minds of others. Uh, honorable delegates, I would, make, uh, I would like you to keep in mind that when you rise on a point of reply, a point of reply you correct the precise misrepresentation. You don't, just, you, you don't go bringing in other elements that were not mentioned by the delegates. So you, can, you keep that in mind. You can also rise on a point of information to solicit information. So assuming the delegate of Nigeria is given a position on Boko Haram and he makes certain statements 
you can write on a point of reply, uh, sorry, point of information to actually solicit, solicit information on what the Nigerian government is doing or how he or she thinks or how the delegate thinks that the international body would be useful to Nigeria in fighting Boko Haram. So you can write on a point of information on that score. Honorable delegates, again, I would mention that there are three avenues for debate in modern UN. We have the formal session, which is the session in which the the, uh, position, the position of your country is being discussed. That is where the speaker's list is used and the time as allocated is also used. But you can move into a caucus referred to as the moderated caucus. The moderated caucus is an opportunity to discuss very specific issues that can be drawn from the main committee topic. So assuming you are discussing the HIV AIDS and how to combat it, the cause of HIV AIDS is a specific issue in respect of HIV. The effect is another specific topic and the remedies or how it can be cured or how it can be managed is also another specific. So what you can do is that if you want a specific topic or a specific issue from the main topic to be discussed you move you raise you rise on a motion to move the house into a moderated caucus so it's as simple as raising your placard you get to the attention of the chairperson or the president he calls you and he states your country of delegation and states that you want to go into a moderated caucus states why you want to go into the moderated caucus and state the number of minutes you want to spend in the moderated caucus. So now, delegates, this format should be used. One, your country of delegation, the, the motion on which you are standing, which is you designed to go into a moderated caucus, the specific topic you want to discuss in the moderated caucus, and the number of minutes or hours you want to spend in the moderated caucus. The chairperson will acknowledge it and there would be a vote and if majority of the members agree you would go into a moderated caucus another caucus is the unmoderated caucus the unmoderated caucus is i would say an informal session where the chairperson does not interfere in the activities during the informal caucus mostly the, 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 the members of the committee move into informal caucus to discuss issues that have that been stagnant in the formal and moderated caucus or to put together their working papers. Honorable delegates, there is a temptation to always abuse or use the time that has been allocated, allocated for unmoderated caucus for other activities instead of focusing on their committee activities I would, I would advise strongly that you use the unmoderated purpose wisely because you are here to learn you are here to be better people so when the, the when the unmoderated purpose elapses you move into the formal session when the time elapses you move into the formal session you always have the opportunity to return to the unmoderated purpose so at this point the, the we are in the formal session and the various uh, delegates are giving the positions of their country um, we are as i've already mentioned you have the right to stand on the point of order the point of information which i've explained the point of the right to reply which i've explained i've explained to you how you can suspend debates one other motion that you can rise on is the motion to adjourn the meeting. Honorable delegates, as I've mentioned, these are specific motions that you should be familiar with in order to enjoy the model United Nations experience. So, the adjournment of meeting or the motion to adjourn meeting is, is raised so that the work of the day, so far as the committee work is concerned, is adjourned to the next date 
that committee work is supposed to start. So once the committee work starts, or let's say the, the agenda has been selected and the uh, speakers that have been opened, you cannot raise, it's not advisable, I would say, to raise a motion to adjourn the meeting because you've literally done nothing for the day. So mostly adjournment of, of, of meetings comes at the latter part of the day when there's been so much progress in your working paper, your draft resolution, or even your final resolution, Honorable Delegate. Another motion upon which you can rise is the adjournment of debate. Honorable Delegates, as I've already mentioned, there are topics that have been given to you or your committee will be discussing. So, should there be a stalemate or should you realize that you are not making progress in one of the topics? The structure of the model in the UN is to ensure that there is flow of events. So, you can rise on the point to adjourn the debate. But this, because of the implication of this, of, 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 of this motion, which is that once this motion passes, all activities pertaining to the topic being discussed at a point in time is solved, and you move directly into a new topic. So, irrespective of where you've got into, whether you have working papers, whether you have draft resolution, once the adjournment of debate passes, all those activities ceases, is shelved, and you move directly into a new topic. So, for a, for a motion to pass, for this motion to pass, you would, the, 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 the one person would have to move the motion and there should be speakers for the motion and speakers against the motion. Two, two each from each. Two, four and two against. And the motion can only pass if there is two test majority. So when two test majority are in favor of the motion, it passes. Another motion which you can rise on is the closure of debate. This is where once this motion is passes, then you are moving directly into your voting procedure. This is where you discuss your your draft resolutions into final resolutions. There are two there's an automatic way that the committee goes into closure of debate. Once the speakers is exhausted, automatically you move into closure of debate. So your, your chairs are very well informed and they will know how to ensure that the speaker's list is quite fluid. Because once the speaker's list is exhausted, they are moving into voting procedures. But a delegate can move a motion to move the house into the closure of debate. Where you, would, when it passes, you move directly into the voting procedure, where you discuss your draft resolutions and eventually your final resolution. When a motion of this nature is passed, it will be appointed by the chair, as always, and two individuals who are against the motion will be called upon to speak. So when these two individuals make their statements within fifteen seconds each perfect for the committees. It depends on the discretion of the chair. When these two individuals make their, <coughs> sorry, make their statements known, then it goes into voting. When it gets to test majority, it passes. The committee activity ends so far as the speaker says is concerned and working papers are concerned, and you move into the voting procedure. When it doesn't pass, when you don't get it to test majority, then Honorable Delegate, you continue with the committee activities. Honorable Delegate, should it be that this passes? Welcome back, fellow Delegates. So, before we proceed, we will do a little recap of what we are talking about so far. Instead of by talking briefly about the United Nations Organization, mentioned that it was founded in October 1945, after the Second World War. The various organs of the United Nations, we mentioned the United Nations General Assembly, we mentioned the United Nations Security Council, we mentioned the Economic Social Council, we mentioned the Trusteeship Council, 
we mentioned the Secretariat, and lastly, the International Court of Justice. Then we zoomed into the General Assembly, which is the deliberative organ of the United Nations. It houses all the 193 member states of the United Nations and Palestine in the Holy See of Observer Status. And we zoomed into the committee simulations, what you expect during the committee simulations, and the appropriate procedures that needs to be followed when you are in the committee simulation. Uh, the United Nations organization is very procedural. The activities is very well structured and you would have to follow those structures in order to fit in and better enjoy your experience with Model United Nations. So we started off from the committee chairs, you know, welcoming all the committee members into the committee and uh, ordering the house to order, after which a roll call would be called. When the roll call is called, we mentioned that there are two appropriate responses that comes up. Either you are present or you are present and voting. For observers who may be part of the committee or who may join the committee, your only option is to vote present because you can only take part in procedural matters. Delegates who respond present and voting means that they are taking part in all procedural and substantive matters. But once you mention that you are present and you are voting, it means you forfeit the right or the privilege of abstaining from a vote. Keep that in mind. Because during the substantive issues, which are basically the, the vote on the working paper, vote on the draft resolutions and the final resolutions, all delegates are expected to vote yes or no, abstain or pass. But for procedural, you cannot abstain, honorable delegate. When, it come, when motions are passed and they are subjected to a vote, you are expected to vote. But when it comes to the resolutions, you can abstain from a vote. So we look into the process of adopting a topic. We mentioned that motions should be called, motions should be accepted to pass the topics. We've looked into the opening of the speakers list, which I've mentioned at our conference. It's an open speakers list, it never closes. So when you want to be a part of it, you inform the chair and you are part of the speakers list. Uh, country, uh, delegates are given 90 seconds to read out the position of their country in respect of the various topics. We looked at some motion that can be passed. We looked at the first motion, the motion of point of order. Point of order, point of order is passed to correct procedure abnormally. If you think that the chair have not properly applied the procedure, you call his attention by raising a point of order and to be looked into when you right the correct procedure is um, used and the committee simulation continues. We've looked at closure of debates, which when it passes, we to test majority. And with two individuals who are against the motion, have made their statements. When, when it passes, it means the committee zooms in directly into voting procedure. And I did mention that the other means by which we can go into the voting procedure is when the speaker's list is exhausted. Again, we looked at the adjournment of debate, which when it passes with simple majority, after there have been a vo uh, two persons have spoken for and two have spoken against the motion. When it passes, the topic being discussed is shelved and the new topic is adopted. And before Honorable Delegates, the topic that was shown is discussed. There have to be something we call the reconsideration. When a motion is passed for reconsideration, honorable delegate, it can only be reconsidered if one, the person who passed, who who stands on that motion or who raise, rises on that motion, was part of the previous motion that was accepted. He should be on the part that favored. The suspension of the, the 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 previous topic again there would be two speakers who would have to speak against the reconsideration and when two test majority is secured then it passes if it's not secured then it doesn't pass again we looked at suspension of debates which can be called at any point in time when one rise on the point of sus suspension of debate we mentioned that 
he doesn't need to explain the purpose for which the, he, he or she wishes that the debate is suspended but the period for the suspension would have to be stated all it needs is a simple majority it does not go it does, it's not debated once the motion is mentioned the chair makes it known to the house and it's subjected to a vote when a simple majority is uh, when you gain a simple majority then we go into that motion we discuss that again we discussed the moderated caucus and unmoderated caucuses the moderated caucus is a, a, a debate avenue where a delegate moves for a moderated caucus and he states the topic that needs to be discussed in the moderated caucus and again states the period or the minutes or the time duration for the moderated caucus after the when the time elapses, we move back into the formal session again same with the unmoderated caucus where when a delegate moves for an unmoderated caucus at a specific time is, 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 is given and when that time is subjected to vote and the, the time is up they reconvene so before we left we got to the point where we are moving into the voting procedure honorable delegate and this is a very critical part of the modern united nations experience before the the voting procedure commences one ideally there should have been working papers that are ready and have been introduced and have been given to the committee days or the secretariats which would be accepted as draft resolutions would would, would be looked into honorable delegates working papers cannot be discussed during committee meetings unless it has the authorization of the committee chair and it has it has moved from working papers into draft resolutions to honorable delegates so when a draft resolution is pre presented to the committee from the days to the committee then all delegates would have the opportunity to scrutinize the draft resolution ordinarily every draft resolution or every resolution i would say has some very key components one the resolution would have a title it could be resolution 1013 they have resolution 1345 they have quite a number of resolutions so the resolution have a title and that was decided by the secretariat and there would be the preambulatory clauses the preambulatory clauses gives the resolution a context within which it finds itself um, if it has to do with a subject matter probably it might have already been discussed by the united nations so references will be made to the various discussions so the preambulatory clauses gives context and they are the operative clauses or the verb clauses these are the action points the action points that would be implemented or that the united nations or the committee seeks to implement and resolutions or draft resolutions have sponsors and signatories honorable delegates you should take notes sponsors are the authors of the draft resolution and signatories are delegates who seek to make statements on the draft resolution or make inputs on the draft resolution or ask questions about the draft resolution so the sponsors of the authors of the draft resolution are referred to as the sponsors and delegates who seek to make input or ask questions or debate the draft resolution are the signatories there are various amendments that are taken into consideration when the draft resolution is discussed we have the friendly amendments and we have the unfriendly amendments and we have the division of questions we will look into all of it firstly friendly amendments friendly amendments are amendments that has the support of honorable delegates the sponsors so when the sponsors are in support of the amendment it's called a friendly amendment when the sponsors are opposed to the amendments that that have been introduced or that six that's uh, uh, the delegated delegate seeks to uh, input into the draft resolution is called an unfriendly amendment honorable delegates 
So we, uh, in the course of our discussion, we realized that we'll get to the point where, in some cases, sponsors of a particular draft resolution even vote against the resolution because they believe that the amendments that were done in them are unfriendly to them. And there's the most important, there's the division of questions as well. So when we move into the voting procedure, this is a very, very critical part of, as I already mentioned, of the activities. Firstly, the committee doors would probably be locked. Absolute quietness is required. Sharing of information among delegates is discouraged. Delegates who move out during the procedures might not be allowed back into the committee room. And head of delegations who move out may be allowed back into the committee room, but they may not be allowed to vote on the resolution or the draft resolution, sorry. So honorable delegates, at this point in time, you should be very, very careful. We demand 100% concentration, 100% discipline, 100% focus when we get to the voting procedure. So during the voting procedure, honorable delegate, you should know that the part of the resolution that can be amended mostly are the operative clauses or the verb clause, as I've already mentioned. The preambulatory clauses are fixed, you cannot touch them. So the every clause can be taken out as an indiv as an individual clause and worked on, uh, being it a, uh, a friendly amendment or an unfriendly amendment. And another avenue for amending the the, the, the draft resolution is the division of question. I remember for, for, for clarity amendments basically means that an addition or subtraction or tweaking the wording of the clause. So uh, we've discussed friendly amendment, we've discussed unfriendly amendment. So we come to division of question, honorable delegates. In some cases, when the resolution is being discussed, some delegates feel or have the conviction that some clauses are so significant they should be made to stand alone. So that whoever reads the resolution can actually sieve out and actually appreciate the importance of those clauses and in this instance the division of question is used so when the division of question is used and it passes it's, it's used as an annex to the resolution so before a document or before a clause gains that um, significance okay there are two votes that comes in here so a delegate would first have to move a motion that clause 1, clause 10, clause 15 should be subjected to division of question. And when this is done, honorable delegates, the chair will make it known to the house and two individuals will speak for the motion and two will speak against the motion, honorable delegates. After that has been done, it should be subjected to. So, this one is called the procedural vote. Procedural vote. This vote is done to decide if a consideration should be given to the motion to annex the clause. So, when this procedural vote passes, then it moves to a second stage. But if it doesn't pass, it still stays in the draft resolution, honorable delegate. But should it pass, it comes to a second stage or a second vote called the substantive vote, honorable delegates. So here, it's not subjected to debate, but it's voted on, the clause is voted on to determine if it should be annexed or discarded. So when this voting is done and it does not receive the majority vote it should get, a simple majority vote, the clause or the clauses are eventually discarded and they do not find their way again in the resolution of honorable delegates. They do not find their way, their way again in the resolution honorable delegates. But if they do succeed, then honorable delegates, they are annexed to show their importance. So these um, votings go on and off severally until eventually the 
documents adopted by the House as a final resolution. And at this point in time, I believe there will be smiles to the committee because the purpose really is to ensure that we come to a resolution that would have an impact on what we set out to do, Honorable Delegate. So, as I've, as, as I've, I've, I've enumerated from the start, it's quite procedural, and I believe that most of you have been looking through your rules of procedure, and some words might not be familiar to you, or some words might be confusing. I would advise that you get in touch with the secretariat, they are available to help, and your various committee chairpersons are also available to help you understand the, the, the various procedures and structures used during Model United Nations activities. Honorable Delegates, at this point in time, I would like to appreciate and thank you for your time, for staying with us through this period. And it's our expectation as the Secretariat and General Assembly that upon your arrival, you have a, a, an amazing experience in Ghana and one that is filled with impact, accumulation of knowledge so that when you return to your various countries, you would be able to say that indeed you went for a Model United Nations conference and you understood the procedure so well that you gave your best. Thank you very much and have a good day.